Her parents' room at home place had been shut up for a week. The calico blind on the window that faced south over the front garden had been pulled down. Polly went in and bolted the door behind her. But when she opened the wardrobe and saw the rows of her mother's tightly packed clothes, she suddenly dreaded touching them. It was as though she would be colluding in the inexorable departure that was already a week old. It was all part of her not being able to take in the forever bit. She was doing this for her father, so that when he came back from being away with Uncle Edward, he would not have to be reminded by the trivial, hopeless belongings. Now let's take a breather. Who sticks? I can't tell you how grateful I am for you seeing me through this bit of it. Yeah, least I could do for you, old chap. Here, you take this one. I can't help thinking if she could have been saved. But you saw how she was. She couldn't have gone on like that. Oh, come on, other side, or we won't see who's won. I mean, if they had found out about the cancer earlier. If she told me when she'd begun to feel unwell. If they operated sooner. No point in torturing yourself, old boy. Ah, there it is. Mine, I think. In the end, you know, we talked about it. I discovered that she had known how ill she was for months. She'd made herself eat an ordinary dinner that night to please me. She was very sick. And then very upset because she said she hated me having to clear it all up. I told her that being able to do anything for her was a, a joy, a blessing, some kind of relief. And then, when I got her a clean night dress and was helping her get into it, she told me she knew she was dying and she knew I knew. I'm afraid yours seems to have got stuck somewhere. I'm sorry, I'm boring you. No, not at all, old boy. Uh, go on. I want to be able to say anything to you, she said, because soon I won't be able to say anything at all. And after that, we talked and talked. It was as though we'd just met, and when she became too tired to talk, I read to her. She especially liked poetry. I brought a couple of her favourite books with me. Ah, good. Oh, there it is. Must have got snagged on something. That's me. Slow but sure. <laughs> when we get back to the hotel, would you mind, old chap, if I left you to your own devices for a couple of hours? Lunch appointment. I thought Miss Sifang had cancelled all our engagements for this week. It's not exactly work. Edward. I won't be long. No, it's not that. Look, I might as well come out with it, but Billy was so very good with Sybil and so perfectly kind to me after she died. I cannot bear to be complicit any longer Understood. in your affairs. I do urge you to finish with this Denise. It's Diana. It has been for ages now. Oh, whoever she is. It's just not fair. I know, I know. I intend to. When? Today. Then go with my blessing. It's me, Clary. I brought you a sandwich. I'm not hungry. Oh, I know, Paul. But don't let that stop you eating it. You choke me. I'm in such a rage. Who with? All of them. Treating me like a child. Telling me their cheerful lies, first about possible recovery, then, oh, she's not in any pain, and finally, the biggest one of all, a merciful release. How is it merciful if there was no pain? How stupid. How dare they treat me like a child? At least you got to say your goodbyes. That's the point. I wasn't able to say goodbye. By the time they let me see her, she was past recognising me. Oh, I'm sorry, Clary. How could I when you've lost both your parents? I still believe Dad's alive, even if no one else does. I know. I know you do. Thanks for the sandwich. Would you like me to help you? No. 
Thank you. But I'm better on my own. Honestly, Edward, darling, as soon as I've had this baby, I'll simply have to find somewhere else to live. Apart from the fact that the cottage is too small to have the boys with me, it isn't even large enough for Jamie and a baby. I'm sorry, darling, it wasn't much of a lunch. <laughs> but I thought we'd rather go somewhere quiet, where we could talk. <sighs> this coffee is perfectly beastly. I shouldn't drink it. But we haven't talked much, not really. What about Scotland? I couldn't live there. They wouldn't want me. I thought you said they did. That was only immediately after Angus died. They felt they had to offer. They'd have been appalled if I'd agreed. Diana felt panic rising. He couldn't. Surely he wouldn't try and ditch her now. Darling, I feel so utterly useless. Just a bloody awful situation. I ought to be looking after you, and I can't. I know you can't. I do understand. Oh, I know you do. You're a marvellous person. Mm. Sorry, Paul. It's me again. I'm ready to send me up with a cup of bovril. Come in. How are you getting on? Oh, you've almost finished. Yes. I thought I heard Wills before. Sounded as though he was about to have a tantrum. He desperately wanted to meet the bus from Hastings. Why? Well, he got Hastings confused with heaven and thought your mother would be on it. <laughs> oh, poor, oh, poor Wills. <laughs> He's all right now. Aunt Rachel has let him play in the sandpit with his cars. Oh, Paul, I'm so sorry. I'm all right, Clary. I just need to get on with this. Please thank Aunt Rachel for the bovril. Edward, I really don't I think often I... pretend it's my birthday, so let's pretend it's yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Cazalet, sir. Uh, are you looking for something in particular? Amethysts. I'm sure you could find us some nice amethysts, Mr. Green. Several items in this case just here, sir. Hmm. Well, that necklace with the tiny turquoises end looks splendid. Why don't you try it on? Uh, Diana did not want a necklace. When on earth would she wear it? Uh, but she unbuttoned her coat and bared her neck, which, humiliatingly, turned out to be too large. I could always arrange for some extra chain to be put at the back to enlarge. No, no. Let's try something else. <clears throat> what Diana really wanted was a ring. Mm -hmm. But she had a sense that this would be the wrong thing to ask for. For a moment, she wondered quite madly whether Edward had strings of women who had had his children. Whether the anxious Mr. Green was utterly used to visit upon visit with different women. Hey, darling, look. What about this? It's lovely, but... Uh... Let's try this one, Mr. Green. Yes, of course, sir. There we are. Do you like it? I do. If Madam is not absolutely sure... The only thing is, I don't know when I would wear it. Nonsense, darling. We'll take it. Let me just wrap it up for you. You can wear it in bed with me. <laughs> Well, it certainly makes a glamorous alternative to utility nightgowns. <laughs> Darling, you don't have any utility nightgowns. Oh, no, but I soon shall have. The government has said no more embroidery on lingerie. Oh, rotten bastards. Perhaps you'd better buy you some of that before the shops run out. They need coupons, darling, and everybody's short of them. I do hope Madam has much pleasure wearing it. Thank you so much. Darling, it's a marvellous present. Glad you like it. Daddy, what's wrong? Has something happened? No, 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 Polly, sweetheart. I've been thinking about what your mother would have wanted. And so I've asked Uncle Edward to drive me back this evening. But is that what you want? Absolutely. It is. I'm missing you and Wills terribly. Darling, I wish I could drive you down myself, but Hugh... It's quite all right, darling. <laughs> oh, of course, I understand. She understood, but it didn't stop her minding. 
You're the most understanding girl in the world. Here, I got you the evening paper. I'm afraid there wasn't a country life. Never mind. I can read all about Malta getting the George Cross. I nearly forgot. Uh, Duffling, I don't need three half crowns. Yes, you do. For your taxi, because I can't take you home. It's it's far far too much, and uh, it it won't be more than five bob. The third one is the Edward Medal for bravery, for enduring that ghastly lunch and everything. Up we go. Thank you, darling. Uh, Now, I must fly. I'm late for Hugh already. Fly... After he had gone, and the train had begun to lumber slowly over the river, she sat looking out of the window, trying to sort out the confusion she felt about him. Resentment, anger even, that she should have to have his baby without his public support, that she should have such financial anxiety. Frustration. Here she was, after a four-year affair, more than four years actually, and no nearer getting him to leave his wife. It's very good of you. Nonsense. You'd prefer to be back with your children. I understand. Do you? Absolutely. Did you tell her? (sighs) I couldn't, old boy. I really couldn't. I fully intended to, but for various very good reasons, it simply wasn't practicable. Wasn't practicable? She's having a baby any minute, for God's sake. You never told me that. Well, I'm telling you now. I simply can't upset her. Anyway, she knows the form. I've never lied to her. Is it yours? Yes. God, what a myth. You must be very much in love with her. You bet. I have been for a long time. I managed to pack up all her clothes today because Dad's decided to come back this evening. I'm sorry. Going on about my dad when you don't even know where yours is. When the war is over, he'll be back. I'm sure of it. That's why you keep a journal, isn't it? So he can read about what he's missed. How do you know? I've noticed you watching people and making mental notes. And I'm guessing it's not just for you. Paul, I've noticed something quite important about you. What? All this week, you've kept yourself busy and distracted yourself by being angry at everyone. Not everyone. No. And I know you've been sad for your mother. And your father and Wills. You've even been sad for me because my dad's not here. I know you mean all of that because you're kind and much less selfish than me, but you haven't at all just been sad for yourself. I know you are, but you aren't letting yourself be because you think other people's feelings are more important than your own. They aren't. That's all. Polly opened her mouth to say that Clary didn't understand what it was like for her father or Wills, that Clary was wrong before a warm tide of grief submerged any of that. She put her face in her hands and cried for the first time for her own loss. And Michael, of course. Congratulations. Thanks, Stella. Sorry, it's just old plonk. (laughs) Cheers. It was when she announced that she and Michael Hadley were getting married that Louise first felt it. That perhaps she was in a play. But she wasn't a fully rounded character, like those she'd spent hours discussing in acting school. Rather, she felt more as though she was like pieces of crazy paving or a jigsaw puzzle that didn't seem to fit together or have much to do with her at all. The only time she felt real was when she was with Stella, her old friend, with whom she shared a dilapidated basement flat affectionately known as Mont Debris. How are your parents about it? 
Well, my mother thinks I'm far too young to be pursued seriously, and Michael far too old for me. Well, surely she's impressed by the fact that he's a well-known painter, not to mention officer in the navy. <laughs> she does concede that he's a damn sight better than what she calls those awful actors I got involved <laughs> with in death. Well, not exactly a vote of confidence. Mm. Not that I've ever had one of those about anything from her. Louise is really becoming quite out of hand. <laughs> She's insisted on living in London with Stella, where she can do what she likes. Goodness knows what they get up to. She ought to be doing something for the war effort, but instead she's waltzing from audition to audition, wearing far too much makeup and in trousers. <laughs> God only knows what Michael's parents made of her. <laughs> well, Michael. Your father thought it both a pleasant and sensible evening. Pleasant because of him, Emily. Thank you, darling. Is it because they're a nice couple, the backbone of English society? <laughs> and you? Mm. Well, I suppose I've always preferred the more decorative, less useful parts. You found Louise's father an attractive man, surely? Two MCs and a recommendation for a Victoria Cross in the last war. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> And Villy's a pleasant woman. Oh, yes, most wives are that. The number of pleasant wives I've had to put up with. Thank God your father left politics. It just cut down the number of women one has to dine with. But my darling Z, if you had your way, there'd be no women at all to dinner. <laughs> there'd be you and a world full of handsome, entertaining, daring men. Well, I warned her about you. I said not to allow you to break Louise's heart. I won't. It is constantly happening with girls. Was. Louise is the one for me, of that I'm certain. Now, tell me, what did Father think was sensible about the evening? He thought we got a great many of the tiresome wedding arrangements sorted out without either argument or acrimony, and I'm told that is seldom the case. It was very good of him to say you'd share the cost of the reception. Well, we're inviting so many people that it seemed to me right. You are my beloved son, and I am one of the few women on whom it would be no good practising the cant of losing a son and gaining a daughter. Although you do like her, don't you, Mummy? Little Louise? Of course I like her, darling. I'm delighted with her. Hmm. So funny and charming and so very young. I'm so pleased. And I shan't lose my son. Nothing but death would achieve it, and I've no intention of dying. Oh, <sighs> I want to see my grandchildren. Far too much for that. Don't you think, Archie, that politicians say very silly things? I mean, no one would think for one moment that you would train people to play tiddly. Look, what, what I think Harry Hopkins meant. Please, let's not talk about the war. People do it all the time and it doesn't make it better. One of the reasons Clary and I wanted to see you, Archie, mm -hmm. was that we wanted to have an important conversation with you. The coffee and liqueurs had arrived and Polly found herself wishing, and not for the first time that evening, that she had Archie to herself. This sounds serious. Is it about Louise getting married? No. It's about us. Getting married? No. <laughs> Archie, who had been at art school with Clary's father, had in his absence become a father figure to both Clary and her brother Neville. But Polly felt his relationship to her was more one of friend and confidant. We think we are too old to do lessons with Miss Milliment, and the adults generally agree. Yes. But the trouble is, they can't agree on what we should do next. And what do you both want to do? Well, what I want is to get a huge lot of experience. I'm just running out of any at home, you see. Polly says she doesn't know what she's here for, and I'm coming round to agreeing with her. About me, I mean. You could be a writer. You used to say that's what you wanted to be. I'm not so sure now. I have an uneasy feeling that people have already written everything. <laughs> We're not like Louise, you see. She always wanted to be an actress. Well, she certainly won't be if her marriage goes ahead. I feel extremely muddled about it all. Did you know what you wanted to do when you were our age? I very much wanted to study at the Slade. I was over the moon when I was offered a place. Do you regret it now? No, not at all, no. I, I, I know I don't make a living or anything like from my art, but uh, I had the most wonderful time. If I hadn't gone there, I would never have met your father or got to know your family. But don't you want to paint again? Oh, yes. I'd, I'd be doing that and living in France if it wasn't for the war. I never thought I'd be grateful to the war for anything, but I am. We'd miss you terribly, wouldn't we, Paul? Yes. 
One thing we thought would be for Clary and me to have a little house or flat in London where we could live on our own. Uh, what would you live on? Easy. We both have allowances now. £42 a year each. If we didn't buy clothes and things, we could easily pay for food and electric light and all that sort of thing. Easily. And Paul wants to go to parties, because we never have much since we were children. You want to go to them too, only to meet people in more walks of life. But when you're called up, having some skill like shorthand and typing would give you a better chance of an interesting job. I don't think women are allowed to do any really interesting jobs. They're allowed to get killed in a war, but not to do any of the killing back. Another injustice for you. You know perfectly well, Clary, that you would loathe to kill anyone. That's not the point. The point is that if women had an equal responsibility about wars, we probably wouldn't have them. <coughs> she half wants to be a pacifist like Christopher, and I agree with that in a way, but she also wants to be able to fly an aeroplane and be in command of a submarine, which you must agree, Archie, isn't very logical. Well, all the same, I do sort of see what she means. I think we should make a move. I'll ask for the bill. Yes. As Polly watched Archie write the cheque, she couldn't fathom why she should feel as she did, slightly ticked off. It wasn't that Archie liked Clary better than her. That was absurd. Hush. Who was that? The Times. The newspaper. Yes. Wanting to know about my being engaged to Michael Hadley. Gosh, I didn't know he was such a famous artist. Well, nor did I. Really? Have you got a fag? Afraid not. We smoked a lot last night. Mm. When are you getting married? In about four weeks. Michael gets leave, then? In four weeks, you'll be Mrs. Michael Hadley? Yes. Aren't you excited? Yes. What does it feel like? Oh, I'm not sure. D stupendous and a bit unreal. I saw I was two people, one whom it was happening to and one whom it couldn't possibly be happening to. It's rather amazing that he should want to marry me. Don't you think? No. Oh, I think it is. His family is frightfully glamorous, you know. They know hundreds of famous people. He could marry anyone. Anyone could marry anyone, you fool. I don't think that's how it works. He says he loves me. <coughs> That'll probably be the telegraph. <laughs> you answer it. Pretend to be the char lady. Oh. All right, ducky. <coughs> <coughs> Good evening, Miss Cazalet's residence. <laughs> Can I speak to Louise, please? And may I ask who's calling? Excuse me, but who are you? Well, I'm the lady what does. Perhaps you'd tell her that her fiancé is on the line. Yes, of course. <laughs> it's Michael. Oh. <laughs> oh, Michael, I wasn't expecting you. Evidently not. Who was that? Only Stella. Larking around. Sorry. Where are we going now? Uh, home, I thought, Polly. Do you have any other ideas? I slightly, only faintly, hoped we might be going to a nightclub. I'm afraid we aren't tonight. Don't belong to one, you see. But if you're very keen, I'll join one and take you at a later date. Louise went once after going to the late joys, and she went on and on about it. Maybe that's another thing she won't be allowed to do when she's married. It didn't stop Zoe. She was always begging Dad to take her. Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't even mentioned your father this evening. I'll write about it in my journal. So when he does get back, he can read about what we were all doing. I suppose you couldn't take two women to one anyway, Archie. Sorry? A nightclub. I could, Polly, if I belonged to one. Hatton? You mean we're going to spend our honeymoon with your mother? You don't mind, do you? N no. You see, darling, Mummy worries so frightfully about me that it seems... It seemed what? She loves you very much, too, you know. She told me that she couldn't imagine a better mother for her grandson. You've been discussing it with her. You told me you wanted six. We have to start somewhere. Michael, I'm not at all sure I want to have a baby so quickly. I mean, I, I do want them in the end, but I want to get used to being married first. Of course you do. But that'll happen in no time, believe me. And if by any chance the other thing does happen, nature will take over and you'll feel fine about it. It's very kind of Archie to give us his bed. Yes, considering he's longer than his sofa and his bad leg always plays him up in the morning. May 
Maybe you and I should have separate evenings with him, Clary. Well, then one of us could have the sofa and he could stick to his bed. I suppose. He does have to get up early and go to work tomorrow. I wonder how he ever does any shopping if naval officers aren't allowed to carry any parcels. He must change into his civilian clothes. Hmm. Or get his girlfriend to do it for him. <laughs> I don't think he has a girlfriend. How do you know? Has he told you? No. But if he had, there would be signs. What sort of signs? Well, pots of cold cream in the bathroom. Anyway, people always talk about the person they're in love with. Look at the way Louise goes on and on about boring Michael oh. Hadley. <laughs> and for all we know, Hotchie might be too old to have affairs. He's not too old. He's actually extremely young for his age. Please try and keep it down, girls. I have to get up for work tomorrow, even if you don't. Sorry! Oh, no! Do you think he heard us? How terrible! He didn't hear me. I hope. I was whispering. And all you said was he was extremely young for his age. So if he heard that, he'd be flattered. Anyone would. Just shush and go to sleep. I can't. I'm too mortified. Oh, shh. Don't give him cause to knock on the wall again. Is everything all right? Fine. Uh, I'll pop upstairs and see if I can scrounge a couple of fags off Mrs. Clark. <laughs> well, I'll have a little dust round, tidy up and empty of the ashtrays while you're gone. I shall miss Mon Debris terribly. And being with you. Be back in a minute. <laughs> But after the front door had slammed, Stella rubbed the unexpected angry tears from her eyes. Louise has already gone, she thought, and she won't ever really be back. Dear Dad, Louise has been married two months now, but most of the last three weeks has been spent with us at home place, because Michael is in the Navy and away fighting. I don't even know if he's anywhere near France, but if he is, it would be so lovely if by some chance you met up with him and he could bring you back to us. There you are. Louise and I have been looking all over for you. Oh, Clary, you're not still writing to your dad. No. No, just making notes. What for? Research. Mm. For my writing. Do you feel different being married? No, not especially. Why not? Why should I? Well, I mean, you're not a virgin anymore to start with. <sighs> I don't suppose you'd tell me what that's like, would you? Clary! No. I thought not. <sighs> I do see how writers get circumscribed by having to rely on direct experience nearly all the time. Or reading about things. Which is not at all the same as someone telling you. You're far too inquisitive in a morbid way. Mm, a bit disgusting to boot. It isn't like that at all. It's simply that if you were really interested in people and how they behave, you would okay. be able... Excuse me. <coughs> Honestly... I'm sick of people accusing me and they're not listening to anything I say. I don't think she feels well. It isn't just a question of whether she's a virgin or not. I'm just as curious about prisoners and nuns and royalty and, and childbirth and murder and things like that. Anything that either hasn't happened to me or couldn't ever happen. Royalty's the only one of them that couldn't happen. To you or me, for that matter. What about your favourite song, Paul? I'm so fond of pleasure, I cannot be a nun. I don't know how fond of pleasure I am. I don't really get enough of it to find out. Well, soon we'll have our own place. Have you told your dad yet? Uh, not yet. Paul. I will. I will, I promise. Louise? Are you all right? You look white as a... Oh, darling. 
How exciting. Does Michael know? Yes. He must be very pleased. He is. Very. Had he been to a doctor? N- n- no. Well, Dr. Carr is awfully good. Eat toast, even if you don't put anything on it. Toast and water biscuits are the thing for morning sickness. Yes, Mummy. How long? Uh, about five weeks, I think. Oh. Seems like forever. <laughs> In the end, Louise stayed nearly a month at home place, by which time Dr. Carr had confirmed her pregnancy. Everybody assumed she was delighted at the prospect. The only person she came near to confiding in was Zoe. Louise, you wouldn't give me a hand putting Juliet to bed. Uh, what do you need me to do? Uh, you give her supper while I clear up. No, you do it, you do it. Oh, thank goodness, it's gone everywhere. She'll need another bath. Oh, I'll just sponge the worst bits off. One has to let them learn. I don't know anything about babies. Neither did I. And it's terrifying, because everybody seems to assume that you do. And and they think you're thrilled. Yes. And you weren't? Not the first time, no. And after the baby died, everyone kept saying I should have another one, and I didn't want to. And oh, then you did. Not then, not immediately. Hang on, Jules. Let me clean you up a bit first. Oh. But when I finally did have her, it was wonderful. It was... Well, with Rupert gone, she made all the difference. I had been dreading something happening to him so much. It seemed like the worst thing in the world that could happen, and, and then it happened. But at the same time, there was Jules. Oh, cry! <laughs> no, onto your pot first. No! All right, all right. You can have a piece of chocolate if you go on your pot first. It usually turns out to be a compromise. Oh, uh, Zoe, I... I'd, I'd rather you dropped the aunt. Sorry, what? I just wanted to say I, I hadn't realised about... what an awful time you must have had. Why should you have? You were only a child. And anyway, it's far harder for you. I didn't start until I'd been married for about five years and Rupert wasn't in the war then. You're doing it all at once. In some ways, this conversation was comforting, but in other ways, not. Perhaps like Zoe, she would feel quite differently once the baby was there. Louise. On the other hand, and for the first time, she came up against the dreadful prospect Louise. of Michael getting killed. Telephone to you, Lou. Who is it? Michael. Oh, thanks. I had half hoped it might be Archie for me. He'd promised to take me to a club. Really? Yes, he said he would. Which one's your favourite? It used to be the gargoyle. But not anymore? No. Not anymore. Oh, Michael, that would be lovely. When? Tonight, if that's all right with your family. You could get here by this evening. Yes. Uh, we've had a bit of engine trouble, and so I'm leaving them to it for a day or two. Everyone will be delighted. And suddenly Louise felt light-hearted with excitement. She went to meet him with Tunbridge, who now called her Madam. Although it was dark, small chinks and streaks of yellow light were emitted by the train as doors opened and some passengers twitched aside the blackout in a hopeless attempt to see where they had arrived. Stations had been without names for so long that most people were used to it and simply counted the number of stops. But there were always a few anxious strangers. Fancy seeing you here. <laughs> oh, I just thought if I meet enough trains, I'm bound to know someone gets off one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see you. How's his nibs? Who? Our babe. Uh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Darling girl, have I missed you? The feeling of exhilaration and happiness came back for Louise. She and Michael sat in the back of the car holding hands and made grown-up conversation for the benefit of Tunbridge. What's wrong with your ship? We've been having trouble with the port engine. Each time they think they've got it right and then it packs up again, so now they're having a really serious overhaul. But the crew is shaking down nicely. Arthur packed some cheese for you. It's in my case. I've scrounged a tin of butter as well, so I hope I'll be popular. Uh, you would be anyway. <laughs> They're all longing to see you. Do you think you could draw Juliet? It would be so lovely for Zoe. Which one was Juliet? My smallest cousin. 
Not easy, because at that age they don't keep still. You're my best sitter, darling. Please. I'll have a go. <laughs> Haven't got much time, though. Here we are. Tumridge will bring your case. Oh. When do you have to go back? Tomorrow afternoon, I'm afraid. Oh. I'm rather hoping that I can get a lift to Lim. Seems to be the nearest airfield to you. It's devilish small for a sterling, but they say they can just about manage it. An airfield? Yes, I'm going on a bombing raid over Germany. Why on earth you... Have they told you to? <laughs> no, I just thought it might be fun. I'm rather interested in camouflage at the moment. Said it would be useful for me to make the trip, and they agreed. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I was going to tell you. I have. I can't think why you would do that. You might... <laughs> You might get... No, that's very unlikely. <laughs> uh, where's the cloakroom, darling? I need to wash my hands before supper, and I've rather lost my bearings. Down the hall, second on the left. Hmm. Alone, remnants of news bulletins kept bombarding her. Three of our aircraft are missing. Two bombers failed to return. He was mad if he didn't have to go, she thought. Of course it was dangerous. It wasn't fair he should risk his life on purpose, as it were, when he'd married her and was so keen on having a family. Well, that's better. Does Z know? That might stop him. Louise was sure Z would be against it. Yes, of course. She doesn't like the idea any more than you do, darling. She loves me too, you know. But she just put her arms around me and gave me a hug and said, you must do what you want. And as she waved me off today, she shouted after me, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. She is amazing. She really is. You, you saw her last night? Did she come to Cowes, then? Uh, no, she came up to London for the night. It was a play of Jack's she wanted to see. Jack? Jack Priestley. Uh, so we went to that. Jolly good it was. Uh, we both thought of you and how much you would have enjoyed it. It was all too much. He'd had three nights leave and he'd chosen to spend the first with his mother and the third on a bombing raid over Germany. <gasps> now, now, darling, you mustn't upset yourself. You really mustn't. This is war, you know. I shall have to do all kinds of things that involve a certain amount of danger. That's what war is. You must learn to be brave. <laughs> oh. I spoke to my dad, and he says we can live in London. At last! Oh, hurrah! <laughs> What's the catch? Oh, Clary, I'm sorry, but I've agreed that we'll live with him. Paul? He says we can have our own rooms at the top of the house, and he'll be out if we need him to be, and... I am sorry, but he just looked so hurt when I said we wanted somewhere on our own that I couldn't argue. I understand. You're not disappointed. <laughs> of course I am. But I do understand. Thanks. The following afternoon, Villy drove Michael back to the airfield. Jules, who'd taken quite a shine to him, insisted on coming. But as she would not have been alone with him in any case, Louise did not very much care. Michael had brought some petrol coupons. He must have planned the lift, she thought. It seemed to her that all his arrangements about life were unknown to her until they happened. She sat in the back of the car with him while Jules chatted away to Villy in the front. Louise had become very passive and simply concurred in everything, but inside she felt cold and heavy with fear. In an hour, she thought, he would be gone and she might never see him again. And he seemed unaware unconscious of what this meant. Right, here we go. Mustn't keep them waiting. Keep safe, Michael, dear. Goodbye, Villy, dearest. Goodbye, Juliet. Me go, me go, me! No, no, you can't go. Not this time, Jules. Come on, let's get back in the car. I'll finish your portrait next time. Finally, Michael turned to Louise and gave her a kiss on the mouth of the kind that's almost over before it's begun. Keep your pecker up, my darling. I'll ring you sometime tomorrow. Promise. Louise stood and watched Michael climb up into the bomber. 
watched them pull up the narrow stairway after him, watched the door or hatch or whatever it was slam shut, removing him from sight, watched the huge, unwieldy plane turn and then taxi away down the runway. Would you like to stop and have tea in a tea shop in Hastings on the way back as a bit of a treat? Okay. okay. Do you want to do that, darling? No, 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 thank you. We'll go home. Okay. They won't have any jewels anyway because of the wretched rationing. Oh, dear. <laughs> there, there. Shh, there, there. That evening, Louise stayed with her family to listen to the nine o'clock news. Soon, she was unable to bear the atmosphere of covert sympathy. So she escaped to bed, where she had what her family would have called a good cry. She had begun to be afraid that Michael did not love her, and that he would be killed. Rachel? But Happy New Year, said darling, all the same. <sighs> Actually, it isn't New Year for some hours yet. You know how disappointed I am. Or perhaps you don't. No, I don't think I do. Well, I am. But I simply can't abandon the poor Duchy with nobody to look after her. Nobody, Sid thought. The house is chock-a-block with people and servants. What does she mean, nobody? Well, I suppose if I broke my leg, you'd come and look after me. Darling, you know I would. Irony was not part of Rachel's makeup. The eager sweetness of this response brought tears of love and resentment to Sid's eyes. The little respite of Rachel spending two nights with her in London was foiled, like so many other anxious, hopeful plans they made these days. Usually it was the Brig, the old despot, who frustrated them. Now it was the Duchy with flu. Rachel will always have to look after them until we too are old, thought Sid. Is there any way you could possibly come down here? You know perfectly well I'm on call. I didn't do Christmas, so I have to do New Year's Eve. All right, darling, I quite understand. I'll be up at the end of next week anyway. You always say things like that. Do I? What I meant was, I've got to go to the dentist. I think I've got an abscess coming back on a tooth. Is it hurting? Off and on. Aspirin keeps it at bay. I must go, I'm afraid. Others are wanting to use the telephone. Happy New Year again. Rachel... Whatever happens, we'll go away later in the year. Please, let's not make promises we might not be able to keep. Darling, I would if I could, you know that. I hate having to break my word. If you hate it so much, why do you make yourself do it so often? Sid had wanted to shout. But of course, she didn't. I know. Why didn't you ring up that poor girl and have her to supper? What poor girl? The one you sometimes give private lessons to. I give lots of private lessons. I have to, to make ends meet, Sid added in her mind. The one who can't afford to pay, who sometimes does some cleaning for you instead. Thelma? Yes, Thelma. Why didn't you invite her over? Be because she's one of my students. But she must have been to your flat many times. And you've taken her to concerts. The odd one or two, but asking her to supper, I don't know, seems to place the relationship on a different footing. It is New Year's Eve. And I imagine she'll be on her own, too. How do you mean? Didn't you say her parents had both been killed in air raids? Oh, well, yes. So, I don't think it would be inappropriate, not in the circumstances. It would be an act of kindness. When Rachel had rung off, Sid thought, why not? She was so fed up and used to being disappointed. So tired from endless hopes being frustrated and deferred, so exhausted by the chronic jealousy that Rachel's unselfishness so constantly presented, and which always brought with it the nagging fear that her importance to Rachel was waning, or had never really existed in the first place. The idea of spending the evening with Thelma, someone who worshipped her, was a kind of balm. Somebody at least who cared to be with her, would understand if she was suddenly called out to the ambulance station, would wait until she returned, and would certainly appreciate the modest feast she had collected to enjoy with Rachel, that she certainly would not have the heart to eat alone. Hello? Uh, Thelma, it's me. Sid. Oh, Sid, I was just thinking about you. 
Really? Actually, I was just trying to pluck up the courage to telephone you. Courage? Well, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure that I do. Uh, but anyway, I was just wondering. You were too. Thinking about me at the exact same time I was thinking about you. Don't you find that the most amazing coincidence? <laughs> I suppose. Uh, what were you thinking? Uh, I was wondering if I might bring a small New Year's gift round. Oh, that's very kind, but you shouldn't have. I won't stay. I know you've probably got plans. Actually, I haven't. Oh. That's why I rang to ask if you'd like to come for supper. This evening. Yes, that is if you have no other plans. No, none. Would I mean? Do you think that might mean that we might see the new year in together? Oh, I don't see why not. Perhaps you'd better bring your overnight things. Are you sure? Well, a cab back to your digs would be prohibitively expensive. I could walk, I suppose. Nonsense! I wouldn't hear of it. What time should I come? Any time that suits you. I'll set off now. And Sid, thank you. It seemed like a small practical kindness. What Rachel would certainly have done, Sid said to herself. She felt tired and dispirited. She would be forty-four when the new year was a week old. And felt as though she would never stop living from hand to mouth, with not very much in her hand. Happy New Year, Diana, darling. Oh, Edward, you shouldn't say that. It's not going to be New Year for another four hours yet.、Mm. I shall probably say it every time I have a drink, which tonight will be rather often. Bad week. Sodding awful week. You again? Oh, I don't know what's got into the old boy, but these days, whatever I say, he deliberately takes the opposite view and then sticks to it. Nothing will shift him. I thought you said it had been better between you since his wife died. Well, I thought so too, but these days he seems to go to the old man and gets him to agree with him about any decision that I disagree with. You should have it out with him. I have. I said it's a pity that you should see fit to talk to him behind my back. And what did you say to that? Does it? Edward didn't tell her that you had added. I thought you were rather in favour of doing things behind people's backs, and this oblique but unmistakable reference to Diana had enraged Edward so much that he had got to his feet and left Hugh's office, slamming the door behind him. Damned cheek! Of course, from a conventional point of view, Hugh was right, but he seemed to take no account of feelings, either his or Diana's. He was in love with her. She had had his child. He couldn't abandon her now. He couldn't think beyond now about that. I'll have to go off,、uh, darling. Just relax. Have another whiskey. Put another log on the fire, would you?、Mm. When was this chimney last swept? When did I last have money to spare? Diana wanted to retort, but instead she pretended she hadn't heard him. I've just got Susan off, so please don't get him too excited and to make too much of a noise.、Mm. Right ho! Oh, dinner's almost ready.、Mm. Ah, hello, old boy. Hello, old boy. I'm not actually old. Well, I am old, but not as old as you. You must be very, very, very old. Well, yes, I am. I'm certainly feeling it this evening. How old are you? Forty-six. Forty-six. Oh, good God. Jamie, I don't think you should say that. My grandfather in Scotland says it all the time. He even said it about a wasp on his marmalade at breakfast. So of course I picked it up. Mrs. Campbell, who cooks there, says it's astonishing what I pick up. If you pick things up, you can't help it. What do you think of your new sister? I don't like her. I'd much rather we had a dog, because she's ugly and stupid, you see. Oh well. I expect you'll like her when she's older. I don't expect. Will you read me a story? Not tonight, old chap. I'm going to have some dinner now. 
Then tell Mummy to. Well, I'm sure she'll pop up and see you after she's had her dinner. Good night, Jamie. Uncle Edward, if I shot her, would I get beheaded? <laughs> I should think you jolly well might. Good God! <laughs> I don't think he meant you. I think he meant. Susan. Oh, I know that, but he's fearfully jealous, poor lamb. <laughs> but he wouldn't do anything awful to her, would he? He might try to. You, you have to try and imagine what it's like to be him. I'm afraid I can't remember being that age. Supposing, just for example, you suddenly took me back to home place one day and told Villy that although of course you loved her, I would be living there with both of you henceforth. How do you think she would feel? Don't be absurd. Naturally, she wouldn't like it. Well, that's an understatement. Surely, she would be fiendishly jealous. I know I would be. In the short silence that followed, Diana noticed that Edward's eyes had become as bleak as blue marbles. I'm afraid I really can't see the parallel. I only meant that that is how Jamie feels about Susan. I'll get the dinner. It wasn't all she had meant at all. Edward thought. It was as near as she dared get to telling him what she felt. He knew he should take the bull by the horns, but, as his younger brother Rupert once said, when you did that, you have to bear in mind the fact that you are still faced with the rest of the bull. Your timing is much improved. Thank you. <laughs> Happy New Year, Sid. Happy New Year, Thelma. <sighs> oh, you've done the washing up. When did you do that? When you were upstairs making up a bed for me. You didn't have to do that. I wanted to. Well, thank you. You didn't have to make up a bed for me. You don't know where the spare sheets are. There is that as well. As well as what? Nothing. No. Go on. What were you going to say? Only, you know, you don't have to thank me for doing the washing up or, or anything. But I do. No, Sid, you don't. Because I think you probably know by now that I'd happily do anything for you. Rachel. Is that you, Sid? <laughs> I hoped you'd ring back. Happy、um, New Year, darling. Rachel, it's me, Billy. I'm sorry, Billy.、Oh, it's a bad line. I, I didn't think for a moment it would be you. I thought you were at Hermione. I am. I, I just thought I'd ring to see to see if everything's all right. How very thoughtful. The Dutch is still in bed, but over the worst. <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell her you rang. Yes, and I, I wanted. To wish everyone a happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Billy, and to Edward as well. I hope you're both having a wonderful party. <laughs> you deserve some time together. Edward's non-appearance at Hermione's party had caused Billy first anger, then embarrassment, and finally anxiety. Where was he? He wasn't at their London house, and his shaving things weren't there either. He wasn't at home place because Rachel obviously wouldn't have said what she just had if he were. Hermione had been very understanding and said, "Don't worry, something must have come up." But Billy wondered, what on earth could have possibly come up on New Year's Eve? Come on, darling,、oh. time to go up. What time is it? It's just gone midnight. Oh, did I miss it? Just. Happy 1943. <laughs> They might not have exactly seen the New Year in, Diana thought, but at least he was here with her. That had to be some sort of triumph, or at least a step in the right direction.
Zoe Cazalet had thought that a weight would be lifted once she got into the train with a visit to her mother behind her. But the pool of boredom and irritation was quenched now only by guilt. And she thought of ways in which she might have given her mother more pleasure, been kinder, nicer, more patient. Waiting in the empty carriage for the train to start for London, she suddenly thought, supposing Jules, when she grows up, feels like that about me. The idea brought tears to her eyes, and she opened her book. Oh, made it. <clears throat> Cigarette? I don't smoke. Do you mind if I do? <clears throat> Not at all. You sound as though you have a cold coming. I haven't. I, I just read a rather sad bit in my book. Perhaps. perhaps you read a bit that reminded you of something in your own life, and that's what did it. Do you see yourself as a Russian heroine, as Anna Karenina? How did you know? I'm so well educated, I can read upside down. Have you read it? A long time ago, when I was at college. I remember enough to warn you that Anna comes to a sad end. I know that. I've read it before. Is that so? What's it like to read a novel when you know what's going to happen? Once you know the story, you can notice other things. My name's Jack. Jack Greenfeld. Will you have lunch with me when we get back to London? I'm afraid I'm already lunching with someone. Your husband? Um, no, a friend. Are you married? I have been. I'm divorced. How many children do you have? How do you know I have any? Well, if you'll pardon me, I can see you're over 18, and you're not wearing uniforms, so the chances are that you have children. I have one child, a daughter. Show me a picture of her. Um, I have two somewhere in here. She's very like you. Mm. I appreciate you showing me. Where is she? In the country. So you don't live in London? No. Do you mind if I ask you something? I don't think I'm in a position of mine. What do you want to know? Well, is it because you're American that you ask so many questions of a total stranger? I don't think so. I've always been inquisitive. More curious about people anyway. I was hoping you'd ask me something more personal. Once, Zoe would have thought that he was flirting with her, and she would have known exactly what to do, or not do, could have chosen the next move. Now she felt utterly unsure. I know she's not booked in for another three weeks, nurse, but she's been having pain since early this morning. She'd better stay, Mr. Hadley, until the doctor has seen her, after which I've no doubt we'll be sending her home. Right then. Here's her case. Michael, please don't go. You're in good hands, Louise. Mwah. Chin up, darling. We'll have to go right to the top. We weren't expecting you. <clears throat> it's very difficult to be happy in a war. Why do you say that? Because I sense that you are guilty about not being happy. Why on earth should you be? With people being killed all the time, slaughtered, murdered, and sometimes tortured first, and then families being broken up. Everybody without their partner, shortage of everything that makes life easier. A monotonous routine and a general absence of anything resembling a good time. Why should you, or, or anyone else in this island, be happy? You may endure. The British seem to me to have gotten very good at that. But why should you enjoy it? I know the stiff upper lip is deeply embedded in the British creed, but you try and smile with one. <laughs> We've trained our lips. We're used to it. I found that it's very dangerous to get used to things. Anything? Yeah, anything. You cease to notice whatever it is, and worse, you, you get the illusion that you've arrived somewhere. I think one can get used to some things and still notice it. She was thinking about Rupert. He'd been missing for over two years now. That would make it a very serious thing. Yes, it would. 
It does. I still don't know your name. <laughs> Zoe Kazalit. Zoe Kazalit. <laughs> I know you can't have lunch. So, so, would you have dinner with me tonight? And I, I can see you're about to turn me down. Don't. <sighs> Reasons why she shouldn't do this crowded in. What should she tell the family? I'm having dinner with an American I met on the train. Why on earth was she even considering it? This is a very serious invitation. <laughs> I've nothing to wear. <laughs> I need to undress and get into bed. Do you think you could tell me what happens next? I mean, you must know so much about it and I don't know anything. What is going to happen next is that as you're here, I'll shave you to be on the safe side and then I shall give you something to make you sleep. Thank you, Jack. That was a lovely meal. Cigarette? No, thank you. I know you told me that on the train, but I wasn't sure whether you don't smoke or whether you simply don't accept cigarettes from strange men. <laughs> well, you are fairly strange. You haven't told me much about yourself. I answered your questions. Well, I know you're a reporter and photographer attached to the army, and you've been brought up in New York. I need to ask you something. Is your husband a prisoner? What makes you think that? I don't know, just a feeling. You don't talk about him at all. All the time you're talking about your family, you didn't mention him. It's because I don't know what to say. I suppose you could just say what is. He twisted his ankle and got left behind in France after Dunkirk. Just when our hopes were fading, Archie, an old friend of his, brought news of him and... Everyone was jubilant. But that was over two years ago. So he's never seen his daughter? No. I suppose I've sort of learned to live with it. I understand now what you said on the train about getting used to something and still noticing it. Yes. It's kind of unfinished, isn't it? You can't grieve and you can't feel free. It's a kind of devilish limbo. You're the first person to have said that to me. All this time, and... And no one has ever talked to me about it. Ah! Ah! Louise woke suddenly because of the pain. The bed seemed to be full of blood. And immediately she thought the baby must have died inside her. Please, somebody come! Help! Somebody, please! You're disturbing the other mothers. Oh, what's happening? You had a little show. It means the baby's on its way. Don't worry. It'll be hours yet. You sit on the chair while I remake the bed. Louise heaved herself onto the chair. She had never felt so isolated in her life. Why had Michael abandoned her like this? I think this is when I try to court you. I haven't told you how beautiful you are because you must know it. You dazzle. You blind me. But you must be used to all that. I've been falling in love with you since about 11 o'clock this morning, and that's a long way down. Jack. But I got past your appearance hours ago. You look like the kind of girl who plays games, who tries to turn men on to comfort of vanity, but you don't do it. I've been waiting all evening for any of that, and you simply don't do it. I used to. I, I used to... She stopped. The recollection struck her with a kind of confounding violence. Once she remembered, her whole satisfaction in such an evening would have rested upon her partner's responses to her appearance. The thought of this now revolted her. So will you? I didn't mean to ask you like this, but I just have to know. Will you come home with me? Jack. I... She fell silent. 
and simply gave him her hand. During the rest of that awful night, Louise remembered what her mother had told her, that one did not make a noise during labor and managed not to cry out or scream. One more push, then the doctor will give you something and you won't know a thing. And that was what happened. The last push was so agonizing that she thought she began to scream, but the scream got cut off because the doctor put a mask over her face and she disappeared. Or at least, that was what it felt like. She simply ceased to exist. Hello? It's me, Jack. I thought it might be. I saw your note on the pillow. I hate to wake you, but I thought you might like to know the time. <laughs> what is it? Just after ten. Listen, can I call you at home? Call? It's, it's miles away. Sussex, I told you. Uh, not call. Call. Telephone. Ring, as you say. I think that might be difficult. The only telephone is in my father-in-law's study, and he's nearly always in it. Can you spend next weekend with me? We can establish communication arrangements then. Could you, do you think? I could try. I'll let you know. I've written my number at work on the note. I'm Captain Greenfeld, in case you have to ask for me. <laughs> Isn't this ridiculous? Having to behave like a spy or a wicked child. But we do have to. Are you wearing my dressing gown? I put it there for you. Yes, over my shoulders. Please come for the weekend. I don't often get them free. I'll think of something somehow. You are the only girl in the world. <laughs> You have a splendid little boy. Where? He's being bathed. What time is it? Half past ten. I put a nice cup of tea on your bedside table. Thank you. Ah, here he is with Daddy now. Six pounds, twelve ounces. You're a clever girl. Drink your tea. I don't want it. You must drink it to bring your milk in. I'm going to ring your parents and let them know. Then I'll pop back this evening before I go and see Z. Can't you just ring her as well. You know how she longs to see me. I've arranged to spend the rest of my leave with her. Here you are. <laughs> he handed her the baby as though it was a present from him. And she knew from the expression on his face that she should be overcome with delight. She looked at the tightly wrapped white bundle with its small wrinkled tomato colored face, remote and stern and fast asleep. And felt nothing at all.